Welcome to our session, Two Minutes, Two Slides. In this session, our presenters have chosen a clinical pearl to share with you within the time limit of two minutes in two slides. And I will briefly introduce each of the presenters. They've been given the warning. They know that the hook will be out. Um, I, have, I will briefly introduce each presenter prior to their presentation. And as I said, I will be monitoring the two minute time frame and they will receive a yellow card at 30 second warning. So you'll see me waving. After all the individuals have presented, we have 12 of them for you this morning. After they've all presented, we will be determining a winner. There will be a prize winner. You, the voting audience, will choose that winner. So please pay attention. And as we go through all the various speakers, keep in your mind which one you feel most uh, effectively conveyed their clinical pearl. There will be uh, judges who will declare the winner based on your applause. Then after we've declared the winner, should there be time available, we will open the floor for questions as well, should you have questions of the presenters. Finally, at the end of the session, the volunteer will be collecting the evaluation forms, so we do ask that you please complete them and give us feedback for next year for this session. So, with no further ado, I believe we are ready to start. Our first presenter, already ready because she knows she has to run to the podium, is Diana Hopkins Rossiel. She's a U of T graduate with a BSc in physio from 1982. <laughs> she has split her, clinical t her time between clinical work, running a private practice, and becoming an academic. She had written here, she's a jack of all trades. I think she's a Jill. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so they don't start the timing until I start talking and show my first slide. Oh no, don't look up, there's the first slide. Why is it a busy slide? It's a really busy slide as an academic, you don't do a busy slide, but it's because it's a busy life and my clinical pearl is don't look up. So five years into practice, I come back from Massachusetts and what do I say? I say, hey, we should start a cardiac rehab here at this institution. My boss says, sure, why don't you do that? And then I say, okay, I'll do it. And then two years of proposals, nothing happens. So I go out and I do a grant and the grant comes in and I have one year in a gym at Queens and then the grant runs out. And then I say, what am I gonna do now? And then a friend of mine says, oh, you can run a cardiac rehab at my private practice from 3 to 8 p.m. three days a week. I say, okay, good. So I move to the private practice. I get a dietitian, I get a social worker, I get a psychologist, I get a nurse. They all work for free for a year. Woohoo, not for profit, but I have to pay a physician $150 to sleep in the back room. Yeah, that's not working. So it worked out really well. We moved on. So I said, landlord tenant relationship go into an institution. So landlord tenant in an institution where there's doctors there for free and don't know they're working for me. And then I start paying people. And then I say, but what about the people who can't afford to pay? So I get Empire Life and I get a bunch of other organizations and they pay for spots for the people who can't afford to pay. And then I say, oh my God, the Ministry of Health is looking at cardiac rehab and they're doing a study. I want to be a part of the study. They say, but who are you? I say, I'm a part of your study. They go, okay. So I was part of the study and our center was the best uh, on all data except one data point, which I can't remember. Um, and so then they started to pay us in 2002. So then I became a consultant and then I started to do my research there. And then I said, oh, okay. This works. It doesn't matter if you have two jobs and four dependents or anything else. You can do this. If you have a good idea, and it's great for your clients, feel free to go ahead and do it because it will be the thing that keeps you going because you're a physiotherapist. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, she has set a high bar. She actually finished early. All right, we're ready for this. Woo, we're ready for the second speaker. Our second speaker today is Nick Hanna. He is a second year MPT student, soon to be graduating from Western University, AKA UWO. He is, that's my insert there because I am a Western grad. He is passionate about leadership and believes that everyone can be a leader should they choose so and given the right tools and the right resources. Currently, Nick is working to reshape the landscape of PT student representation at the national level, hoping to provide physio students with every possible resource to improve their professional practice and become their own leaders. Nick. Forward and 
that. Yes, and he'll load it up for you. Just want to start by saying I'm the only student up here. Uh, and as a student, I'm, uh, I really love being a member of the CPA, and uh, it certainly comes with its perps, like uh, free membership, and I get access to a number of resources, like career resources. But I think, you know, at the end of the day, a lot more could be done for us and a lot more could be offered, and there's a lot of gaps for us students here at the CPA. And so I'm going to present a little bit of a snapshot of some things that I want to see for us students in the future. So. Just as graduates, what if we had the ability to brand ourselves and market ourselves and really stand out in more ways than maybe a two minutes, two slides presentation could do for me? Or what if we had access to financial advisory services that you know, gave us the confidence in cash flow plan planning and budgeting tips uh, in order to manage our debt? And moving forward, there it is. What about uh, career and professional development? So what if we had the ability to network with PTs from across Canada and in all areas of practice and in all kinds of unique job opportunities? I'm talking Skype-like one-on-ones, posting in online forums, and submitting questions to get answers and really know people and feel involved. Or what if we had access to third-party courses and extracurriculars <laughs> and uh, we had the ability to do those things while we were in school? Bottom line, guys, we are the future of this profession. We are the future membership of the CPA. And we are the future minds that are going to reshape the landscape of physiotherapy in Canada. And I think a lot of gaps are, are present and I think a lot more needs to be done. And I just really believe it's time to start making those changes. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, Nick. So our third speaker of the morning is Priyanka Banerjee Gwinnett. She has her Master's in Physical Therapy from the University of Toronto and her Bachelor's in Kin from the University of Waterloo. She is currently working at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario in both inpatient and outpatient departments. Priyanka. Oh, no. We have to go back one slide. There we go. Okay. Okay. Well. So, consider a consult that reads, seven-year-old female with retropharyngeal abscess, drained. Torticollis and decreased neck range of motion. Neck range of motion improving, torticollis persists. Had ringette injury one to two weeks ago. L uh, left SCM tight plus plus on palpation. Query muscular component to torticollis. On exam, she had negligible neck extension or flexion and no active rotation or side flexion in any direction. She was guarding significantly like this. It was a pretty picture. So could the wry neck be a red herring? So a quick lit search led me to Gristle's syndrome a p as a potential cause of her symptoms. Gristle's syndrome is atlantoaxial ligament laxity specifically associated with pharyngeal infection or head and neck surgery. This disorder occurs primarily in children. Given her age, history of trauma, surgery and infection, could this be a C1, C2 instability or subluxation? So what do you do? You get an ortho consult, stat. X-ray and MRI can help. Here are examples of open mouth and flexion extension x-rays showing C1 and C2. However, CT truly is gold standard. In this example, you see the dens clearly shifted off of midline. In our case, our patient couldn't actually tolerate x-rays. She was in too much pain. So the team decided on an MRI. While MRI results were pending, her virology came back, and they tweaked her antibiotics a little bit. Next thing you know, her neck had full range of motion, and her MRI showed ligamentous stability was actually intact. She did not have a C1-C2 subluxation or instability, and did not have Grissel syndrome. Anticlimactic? Yes, perhaps. Good learning opportunity? I certainly think so. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thanks, Priyanka. Our next speaker is Sandy Rennie. He has taught electrophysical agents theory and practice for over 30 years in undergraduate and graduate entry-level physical therapy programs, as well as providing professional development for practicing physiotherapists. His passion for playing with your parameters extends to this presentation. If you take the time to make adjustments, your treatments just might work better. Sandy. Good morning, thank you very much. I'm so used to teaching students, I'm not used to teaching physios, so listen up. Because <laughs> the students go into clinics and they say, they're not doing it the way you should suggest that we do do it. So here we go. Play with your parameters. When you're doing muscle stimulation, if you want the muscle stimulation to work, don't do the same thing with every patient, because they're not the same. Their muscles are different, their tone is different, their responses are different. So you need to think about the frequency, the rate. Some people might do better at 30 pulses per second, and some people might do better at 75 pulses per second. So think about what you're going to do for that patient. Pulse duration or pulse width, sometimes it needs to be wide, like 450 or 500, and sometimes it needs to be narrow, like 200. Some of our stimulators are too, too limited in what they offer, but this is the sort of thing you need to adjust. Change your on and off times. The muscles need a chance to rest, so if they contract for five seconds, they've got to rest for at least 15 seconds, probably better 25 seconds, a one to five work to rest ratio. And finally, move your damn electrodes. If you're not getting that muscle to contract, you're not in the right spot. Have you ever thought about that? Think about moving your electrodes. You could move them two millimeters and it'll make one heck of a difference. Now we're going to talk about tens. And the guy with the curly hair on the bottom with the electrodes on his shoulder, that's me in 1983. And I'm still getting tens on my shoulder. So what you need to do with TENS is change the mode of your TENS, okay? Maybe you might make it a pulsed mode, maybe you might make it a burst mode. You need to think about A TENS for acupuncture like STEM, and you need to get a little bit of muscle contraction. You need to think about modulated modes when the patient starts to habituate. When they habituate, that means the TENS is no longer effective. And adjust the frequency and the pulse duration on your TENS device. They're there to be adjusted. Don't do the same thing with every single patient. Got it? Thank you. This is so impressive. I put the fear of I don't know what into them that I was really going to pull them off the stage at two minutes, and they are right on the money. So our next speaker, Wendy Lee Hamilton, works for the Seniors Links team, which is a multidisciplinary community-based group of professionals operating within the Nova Scotia Health Authority. This morning, Wendy Lee is promoting a simple idea to improve fitness in the frail elderly population as a means to decrease falls and increase quality of life. Wendy Lee. Slide. Good morning. When the snow starts to fly, our frail community dwelling seniors stay inside and become deconditioned. Last fall, a partnership between Health and Recreation Yield Walk and Roll, an indoor four-wheel walker program. Who attended? We had men and women between 65 to 97 years old with all manner of chronic conditions, people with oxygen tanks, arthritis, neurological gates, mild cognitive impairment, or D, all of the above. When and where, we had three locations, one church gym, two arenas with walking tracks. Indoor walking occurred during daylight hours between October and May. One hour program included a warm up, a cool down, and some socialization. The four wheel walkers were provided for those that had none. Uh, how? Participants were screened using PARQ+. They were taught to use the 10 point perceived exertion scale and the two hour latent pain rule for self management purposes. The physio monitored gait speeds and oxygen saturation if needed. Could you flip the second slide and start the video please? What else? Rest times between laps were used to promote other health and social programs that were ongoing. The physios also did little vignettes on assistive devices to promote safety and independence at home. The results were that gait speeds improved for some. Uh, for many, it improved their walking confidence. The stigma of four-wheel walker use was reduced and several actually purchased their own four walkers for daily use. 
Walk and Rule got participants out using key public recreation facilities that may not have otherwise tried. So yesterday, Dr. Woodhouse emphasized that our profession has a leadership role in shifting the healthcare model. Walk and roll is one inexpensive way to encourage physical activity for sedentary, frail seniors and could be easily replicated. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Wendy Lee. Our next speaker, speaker is Daryl Yardley, who is the chair of the private practice division, and he happens to also be a physiotherapist uh, in an outpatient network in Hamilton. Daryl, please. So Lynn's pretty sure she's gonna have to wrestle me off the stage. I've never spoken a sentence in two minutes. So, so here we go. So it's a little bit different, a little cl clinical tidbit. Diane and I are gonna go head to head on this one. So where are we sitting? We're in a healthcare transformation at this point in time. Physical constraints are facing us, health human resources are changing, and we've got a rapid, rapid advancement of where we're gonna go and where are we driving the bus? Are we gonna basically fall behind? So here's the vision. We've got this golden opportunity, this golden profession, but as Doug Trioler said yesterday, if we fall behind, we're gonna have our heads in the sand. So this is what I would say when I first graduated 10 years ago, we were sort of that sort of front runner profession in med rehab. The issue at hand though is what you heard of the hot topic debate is that movement experts were kind of now in a group of many, many other professionals that are encroaching upon us. And now there's a lot of patients that have choice. So how do we navigate this new system? So what once was an interventionless model, we now have the clinical decision abilities and we've been proven that we're no longer just doing interventions, we're doing differential diagnoses. We've moved into evolving roles and we're now basically about to front run the entire primary care model. But we have to kind of break down a couple of barriers still. We need to stop butting heads on what's better quality, which model of service delivery is better. We know that physio is better, there's not really a need to go head to head with each other. The other issue too is we also need to break down this barrier between public sector and private sector and which one is better. Physio on a whole, we need to figure out how to get out of this sand trap. And how do we get out of this sand trap and become sort of that front runner again like we were at one point in time and how we are moving forward where we're actually about to be that med rehab professional group that everyone's gonna look for. How do we do that? We need alignment. We need to have one vision like Linda Woodhouse was talking about yesterday. We need to look at value. We need to look at the economic value of how, how beneficial physiotherapy is. And we all know that with the shift in, the shift in uh, patient sort of perceptions of what they're looking for, patients these days are consumers. And we all have to come to terms with the fact that whether you're in pri private or public sector, patients are looking for what they want. So we have to be consumer oriented. And the reality is when you look at professional promotion and where we are with professional identity, how strong do you want our identity, identity to be? Thank you, Diana, but thank you, Daryl. <laughs> Our next speaker is Kiara Singh. She's clinical supervisor for physiotherapy at Surrey Memorial Hospital in Fraser Health. Kiara has an interest in both pediatric and adult oncology, specifically in regards to recovery from the treatment of cancer. Kiara, you're on. And I haven't started the timer yet. So if I were to sit here for the rest of the day, like we've all been doing throughout this conference, I might as well be smoking. So by now, you've probably all heard the terminology, sitting is the new smoking. And it doesn't matter how active you are outside of your sitting periods. If you sit all day, it's harmful to you no matter what. So even if I went out last night and ran the PFC run after, um, after sitting all day, I still have a 34% um, increased mortality rate from sitting. So we all know we don't want to be sitting too long and we also know um, that physical activity is a powerful medicine to help prevent and manage over 40 chronic diseases. So knowing maybe half the battle, the other half is actually doing something about it. So patients with chronic disease and healthcare providers who are working with them report that they need help in finding the best resources to help them 
move more, and sit less safely and effectively. So what are we doing about it? Well, in BC, we're working on the Move More, Sit Less toolkit. Um, what's unique about this toolkit is that it's going to have a bunch of resources all in one place for help both healthcare providers and for patients. But what's really more unique about it is we have a team of 95 um, clinicians, patients, all working on rating resources. So these resources are going to go through a, re a, re a review process and they're going to be rated. Um, so it, they'll be easy to use. So how can you help us? Basically, what we'd love you to do is to participate in the process by sending us resources so we can include them in our toolkit, watching out for the toolkit, and finally, using and sharing the toolkit so we all can help both ourselves and our patients move more and sit less. Thank you. Well done. And our next presenter. Our next presenter is Angela Pace. She's a, pub, a public practice physiotherapist, pip, 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 a public practice physiotherapist working in Kitimat, Northern BC. When Angela first came to Canada, she worked as a physiotherapist in the Canadian Arctic. Welcome, Angela. Okay, what I'm going to present is just a, a quick, simple clinical pearl, and it's called towel distraction for long hip axis distraction. Um, just using a small towel that's available at any hospital or in a private practice. Um, long axis hip distraction is a manual therapy technique that I frequently use clinically with the treatment of hip osteoarthritis. Um, the hand placement and grip is important for both patient comfort and also therapist handling. If you could um, do the video for me. I have got a video. Doesn't look like one's going to play. Mm. Video should play. If it doesn't, we can just make it up. Okay, the first video that's playing now is just the normal method that you see, just holding onto the skin and pulling. Often, especially with women that have got um, moisturizing cream on, the hand can slip. And sometimes it can be uncomfortable for guys with hairy legs. You can just pull the hair on the legs. So um, I come up with a method that I uh, learned in the States. We can play the next video. Just by using a simple towel, you can fold it into a quarter, just like you see on the video. Wrap it just under the ankle. Cross it over the ankle joint. And then you just tuck it in underneath. See in the clip now, you can just pull and you get a good distraction. So use this clinical pearl, use the towel technique to increase the control of your distraction and improve the patient comfort. Thank you. That was super fast. You had time to spare. And I think at this point, we got to do a shout out to the video and the AV guys over there because they've had a bit of a time. Awesome making our videos work. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Our next speaker is Simon Oakley, who is a Dal grad. Yay for Dal. Graduated in 1993 and is currently working as a staff physiotherapist for Northwood Incorporated Halifax, Nova Scotia, having 1.8 physiotherapists covering a 485 bed nursing home. He frequently hosts student placements to expand the reach of his service. And so Simon, you're on. I know long-term long -term care isn't always that sexy, but come on now. <laughs> All right, I'll start with the first slide, please. So what do you do when you have two pairs of student PTAs coming to your nursing home for consecutive six-week placements? You teach the PTAs how to safely mobilize and run a progressive walking program. You pick the two dementia units with the highest fall rates. You identify all the residents that can participate and have that pair of PTA see them two to three times per week for four weeks and you track the incidence of falls. Pretty straightforward. I wasn't quite expecting results like this though. Two 33 bed special care units, units A and unit B. The two months previously, 27, 24 falls each on average. The fall rate 26.4 and 23.5 falls per thousand resident beds, 11 and 15 participants of the residents. 
during the walking program of those four weeks, the first unit had five falls, the second unit 10. 6.6, 11.7 falls per thousand resident beds to normalize it. That's a 75% and a 50% a reduction in falls through a simple walking program. Put the PTAs, put the resources in, get the staff into these long-term care homes. That's my presentation. Who said you can't have big impact in a short time? There you go. So our next speaker is Jennifer Howie. She's a clinical owner of Inside Out Physiotherapy and Wellness Group inc incorporated in Toronto. Her physiotherapy path extends from the hospital to successful small business owner. She believes in having fun at work and is known for trying new and crazy tricks. Let's see what lies ahead. And you're right, Daryl, let's see if I can do it in two minutes. <laughs> Just have the slides. Uh, this quote is one of my mantras and why I'm passionate about being a physical therapist and in less than an hour we have 12 examples today. But I find that with the hectic pace of life, it can take us away from the purposeful thinking that allows us to plan to make this opportunities a reality. So my hopes today, if we can advance the slide please, is to share with you a tool that takes us two minutes to 20 minutes to help you create your plan. So as we're very familiar with the plan, I share this with my staff, I tell them to have a professional goal and a personal goal. And then you set your short and long-term timeline for that. But then you should list your missing links. These are the tangible things that you need to make to make your goal a reality. They are what are going to help you execute your plan. Then what is motivating you? I consider this to be one of the most important. What is the emotion behind it? Emotions drive our behaviors and behaviors drive your actions. When I'm going to be at the Pan Am Games this summer learning Spanish so that I could run up and help an injured athlete is far more motivating than just learning Spanish. Finally, what are you going to do today to start making your plan an action? Because a plan without action is just merely a dream. The next thing that I tell my staff to do is to list three personal achievements because we all have successes. Congratulations, graduating class. And you list those personal achievements because when things get rough, then you can remember the, what your determination and perseverance and focus got you in the past. Finally, I like to say give yourself a little reward for one of those short-term goals that once you've accomplished it. And what's the consequence if you're going to not? I hate cleaning my house, and that's the best little consequence I can have. I say print it up, post it where you can see it, because today is the day, and you are the ones that can make it happen. Thank you. We have two more speakers to go before you have the chance to throw your vote into the ring. So our next and uh, second last speaker is Alison Bonnieman. She's the academic coordinator for the Ontario Internationally Trained Physiotherapy Bridging Program at the University of Toronto. Her physio passion is aquatic therapy and she is the founder of the Canadian Aquatic Rehab Institute supporting postgraduate aquatic study. She recently returned from the European Conference on Evidence-Based Aquatic Therapy if there is magic on this planet, it is contained in water. So hello, I am passionate about aquatic therapy and I wish to share this with you in two minutes. I'm the WCPT Aquatic Therapy Representative for Canada and can report that there is increasingly more research to support aquatic therapy as a rehab tool encompassing all conditions I'm going to, um, to support aquatic therapy, all conditions from ICU, uh, neonatal, elder dementia. Early immersion is a standard protocol post arthroplasty in Europe, and there's new research supporting the effectiveness of aquatic therapy in neonatal ICU, um, its effectiveness in spinal cord injury, mental illness, and dementia, and it's a very suitable tool to manage and effectively treat those with comorbidities. We all know the hydrodynamic properties that make it so unique. Most recently, there's been some new research added to the list of advantages. And uh, these are some of the new pathophysiological effects I'd love to talk to you about. 
But I believe there's another advantage, and that's the therapist advantage of the ease of working in the water. I've listed some disadvantages, but I, you could probably think of more. There's incontinence and catheter and open wounds, but these have all been well managed in the pools of Europe, South America, and the USA. But what I really wanted to do is introduce you to a young client of mine who suffered a brainstem stroke four years ago. The first session in the community pool a year ago, she arrived with an electric wheelchair, marked trunk asymmetry, poor head control, and her parents accompanied her into the water. So, um, with a neck collar in place, she works in the pool with me. Um, the environment challenges her trunk and head control. We allow her to lose her balance in the water because she hates getting her face wet. And she works hard for 60 minutes, only two to four times a month with me. She requires three people to assist her on land to walk. She requires one person, that's me, to help her in the water. She can now do pivot transfers into the family car at home with one assist and no headrest. Please keep aquatic therapy in our realm of practice and don't give it away. And our final speaker this morning is Michael Ritchie. Michael graduated another Dal grad in 1979 and focuses his practice towards treatment of temporal mandibular disorder. If he had to do it all over again, he would still choose physiotherapy as his profession. Michael. I've got my He's own He's setting his own timer. I've got my own timer. OK, let's coordinate here. We're ready to go? Just not yet. Awesome. Not yet. Press, not yet. press start yet? Start. OK, OK, start. I gave it up. I'm sorry. I see a lot of patients who um, have seen other therapists and physicians, but especially physiotherapists. And I ask them often, what, what do the other therapists say was your problem? And they'll say, huh? I don't know. I, I, and, and I said, what would they say? What they say? They never told me. And I said, oh, I don't believe that. We're pa compassionate people. We're passionate. We, we want to tell our patients. We are educators. But you know what? Sometimes the message doesn't get through. And I think that we are not very economical with the words. Sometimes we oversell our diagnosis and our information. I call that word economy. We've got to be, get better at it. Luke McDonald at uh, Aerobics First, some of you know at the local here, talks about words per sale. The more words he uses, the poorer the sale. My wife, who used to be in the car business, um, would often say, you know, once you've made the sale, shut up. Don't unsell the car. Don't unsell the service. And for anyone who doesn't really believe this, the power of small words, of powerful words, of word economy, I'd like to present my friend Ernest Hemingway here with his six-word novel. And it's very, very powerful. It, uh, it's, uh, I guess it speaks for itself. Please read that. Word economy. It's very, very important. Uh, I guess once you've made your sale, shut up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, and thank you to every one of these people who went out on a rather proverbial limb to stand in front of you and uh, give their two-minute pitch with their two slides. Mind you, wouldn't you agree with me that they kind of went over the mark a little bit on the two minutes, the two slides bit? Yeah, I think so. But anyway, excellent. Well done. So now they have all presented. I am going to, in a moment, ask them to all stand in front of you here and in the order that they spoke, hopefully, if they can remember that. And then you will be showing your approval, your excitement, as to who was most successful in conveying the clinical pearl, because we will declare a winner, and the winner will get a prize. Um, so, but however, uh, you are the ones that are voting, but we need some judges. And when you came into the room, there were three of you who were given a little piece of red construction paper. Fess up, who got the three pieces of construction paper? Okay, there's one. I need two other people who got the construction paper, which you are now our judges. 
Would you please be so kind as to come up to the front over here beside the table? The three of you with the red construction paper, because I knew that I would not want to be the one that was determining who clapped, got the most clapping. So your duty as judges is to listen, and you can also vote too, is to listen to the applause in the room, because I understand yesterday there was a bit of a controversy about the decibel meter. I understand in the hot topic debate there was some controversy, as, so this we figured was maybe another way to go. You were going to listen, you were going to deliberate, and after we have voted, you will determine the winner on behalf of the audience. Would you please, speakers, come forward. My understanding was there was a bit of discrepancy in how the sound was conveyed in the room. So yes, we do not want controversy for this session whatsoever. And okay, no, not really. So our esteemed judges of Janice, uh, Shara, and Rob. Thank you ever so much for being such good sports. And so, ladies and gentlemen, this is where we will start. The first presenter, Diana hopkins Russell. You'll be careful what you wish for in your applause. Our second speaker, Nick Hanna, National Student Representation, a vision. Uh oh, number three, Priyanka, clinical red herring. Are we missing something? Sandy Rennie, play with your parameters. Are you doing okay, judges? You got it under control? Okay, all right. So Wendy Lee, she was the one that was wanting to rock and roll. And Daryl um, Yardley with Healthcare Transformation, vote for Daryl. Kiara wants you to move more, sit less, get off your derrieres. <laughs> Angela was using a towel to be creative. Angela. <laughs> and Simon did an amazing job stopping falls. Jen wants you to be a successful practitioner in your goal setting. Jen. <laughs> Allison loves the water. <laughs> and Michael is a man of few words with word economy. Michael. <laughs> All right, just let me deliberate with the judges for a moment, please. We have, thank you judges, you may sit down. I believe we agreed. Thank you ever so much. We deliberated. They had some interesting ideas. You might talk to them later about what they thought might have been good for a runoff. We're not doing that. Um, somehow I don't think it would pass muster um, from the CPA. So ladies and gentlemen, once again, my sincere and great appreciation for you putting yourself up here in front of your colleagues, making this a successful session. However, we do want to declare one winner and the winner will receive a prize Kindly, the CPA has uh, agreed to give them a check in recognition of this, as well as we'll presenting them with a certificate. And so the winner is Simon.
Well done. Thank you. Now, by my reckoning, we have just a few minutes left. And uh, we did agree that if there was a little bit of time left, we would allow some questions. And so I have this um, toss mic that if you've been in other sessions, you have seen. It, it, is, uh, it, it is not fragile. You can throw it. It is all encased in foam. All you need to do is talk into this magic little black thing. Um, please don't pull the black thing off because then that's not a good thing. It now becomes not, fra it becomes fragile rather than not fragile. So is any, I see a question. Okay, I'm really horrible with this. <laughs> My question is for Wendy with the uh, walk and roll. And do you have a, plot, you know, a protocol or something that you could send to people so they could replicate? Um, sure, I'd be happy to send you <laughs> any of the, uh, the paperwork, the screening and, and assessment. And, and um, as I was saying, it, it was an, a new initiative. I'd be happy to tell you about the things I did wrong so that you don't have to make the same mistakes that I have. Um, but again, it's, it's uh, uh, perhaps we could see each other afterward and exchange information. Thank you. Great. Any other questions? Yes. Okay. Oh, I'm definitely not going to throw it over there. No, because it's being recorded, so we have to do this deal here. So um, I'm not going to throw it, but. All right. My question is for Simon. Uh, for Simon. Um, I was wondering if what you did with the seniors or uh, in long term care, if that's going to be published? Um, or if you have any references that would present similar results that we can use as a pitch for improving services like you do? Uh, no, I have no plans to publish because I'm a busy clinician, so it's hard to do that. So anyone who would like to help me do that, but this is the presentation on it. It's an uncontrolled uh, clinical experience, so um, you know, where do you actually publish that? I wasn't expecting these results. I think it needs to be repeated, is what hey, I this think. Is, uh, yeah, you need to print it. It's awesome. This is why you won. Yeah. May I suggest to you that you go to a division and mm. have it in their newsletter to start with yeah. and move from there. Seniors help. I can do that for you. Oh, oh we have competition between the divisions. Yeah. OK, division one, <laughs> division two. You now are yeah. a very desirable commodity. Fantastic. That's what I like. All right. Okay, he, he, he will entertain uh, any interest and anything else that might go with it. Any other questions? Yes, okay, you're really challenged. Um, I'm Kate, I'm from CPA, and I actually would really love to publish that in PT practice as one of the little nuggets for an upcoming issue on uh, seniors, so, and age, older adults, so. No offense to the divisions, but I think she just upped the ante. <laughs> All righty, any other people would like to have the mic? We have a few more moments for questions. Yes, oh gee whiz. Question for Jen. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how your staff respond to being asked about motivators and um, and reward and things that they really need to work on? I, I look at it as we're leaders and my job as a physiotherapy owner is to create leaders of my team and to sponge out their potential and then squeeze it and give it back to them. And so um, what I do with this exercise is I give it to them and then I set a deadline and say go home and do it and then they actually put it one copy for themselves and one copy goes in an envelope and three months later they just spontaneously get it again and uh, so I, I tend to see a good response from it and it's something that is for them so I don't see them and uh, so I, I just that's that's the approach that I take with it so thanks good question one more question. There must be some other burning question in the minds of someone out here. Yes. All right. Oh, gee. Well. Thanks, Lynn. No problem. 
as the winner of the two minute two slide from last year, I just thought I'd get the last word. And this, my, my question is for, uh, first of all, congratulations, every those. I'm glad I didn't present this year. But uh, my question is for Daryl Yardley. Daryl, um, as a new grad, we, uh, I have a lot of managers I report to. My question's about collaboration. How do you see or what advice would you give to a new grad on, on advocating for themselves as a millennial in this world of collaboration where we do see the client at the center and how I can kind of brand myself to be successful and unique than my counterparts? Okay, I don't have a slide for that one. Yeah, no. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think one of the things, actually, I was just asked this question not too long ago, so thanks. I think the one thing that when I looked at, when you get to a collaborative environment, the one thing that I think new grads sort of weigh a little bit less is, is their, their, their true clinical abilities that you guys have, but not necessarily what your hands do, but what your minds are capable of doing. So I think with the one piece that we showed is looking at, even though we've gone from this interventionalist com component now, you know, with the ability to diagnose and it's the clinical decision making, I think what you guys have to hold on to when you get into a collaborative environment where you may be with clinicians of 25 years and you're going to be working with GPs, so your cross-boundary sort of professional sort of roles, the key thing is, is to make sure you guys continue to build your confidence. And I think if you build that confidence very early, early on, and I think that's one of the key things, and Jen's talked about leadership a few times, is that's where you really want to seek some of your mentorship as well. Right, so when you get into these collaborative environments, I think at times people will shy away because they're like, can I actually do that role? Absolutely, you can. You know, what you guys come out of school with right now, when you look at the educational curriculum, it's so far advanced. It's just about give you that, give you, you need that little extra kick of confidence because you guys already have the abilities, right? That's how you got into physio school. And I think now that's how you'll survive in that collaborative practice. But also remember too, is your mentors don't always have to be clinicians or they don't always have to be within the physio spectrum, right? It's always good at that point. But one of the things I would say is don't be afraid to sort of reach out and use your mentor to build your confidence. So use your network to do the same thing. Good. Did that work? Thank you. Okay. <laughs>Thank you, Daryl. What a really nifty note to end on, uh, that it's not just what we have in our hands, but it's the capacity we have in our minds, and we mustn't forget that. Thank you again ever so much for a fun time together on the two minutes, two slides, and on behalf of the Canadian Physiotherapy Association, I thank each one of our presenters for being here. Thank you for your attention, your participation, your engagement, and if you particularly enjoyed it, it was recorded, um, um, video as I understand, so wow. Um, and also please, in this case, remember to complete the evaluation form to give us on the committee feedback for how to make this even better for next year. Have a wonderful last day of Congress. Best wishes.